Hey guys, so in this video, I am gonna go over the board layout for the 3D printer enclosure. Uh, I was hoping to have the actual board in front of me, but it's not back from Fab, and I'm trying to get out a video every week, and I wasn't gonna wait for that to be done. So this one's gonna be a little bit different. Um, I know I've been saying that a lot. But I really want to thank you guys for your feedback on the last video when I asked how you wanted to see the board layout videos and I guess to the schematic videos in the future. And there was a lot of really good feedback. Um, kind of the two-ish consensus is that you said was first just go over the finished board and go into a more detail on like the challenges and difficulties of it. And then the other was doing a time lapse and just discussing it as it goes. So this board, as I said in the last video, is already done. So I am just going to do the former. So the board's done and I'm just going to talk it over. And please let me know what you think about this. And then a question for this video that I have. And I'm still obviously going to keep doing the types of videos I am. But would you guys rather see like primarily project-based videos like I'm doing now to where, hey, we have a project, we need to get it from design, schematic, uh, finished layout, and then testing? Or do you like more of like specific topics like picking a MOSFET, picking a voltage regulator, stuff like that? Or kind of on the same thing, like I did the pull-up resistor video to where it's a project that we did for a client, like an actual paid job, and we had an issue with it or troubleshooting it and like how we figured it out. Or do you like all of them and just keep doing it and sprinkle them in here and there? Um, I really appreciate when you guys uh, give me that feedback because that's the only way I'm gonna know uh, how the channel should grow and change in the future. So with that all being said, um, here is the finished layout. Uh, it's the obviously the 3D view, and I figure this probably makes the most sense to start with, So, because that's how I figured out the layout. So basically, it is going to be mounted on the top of the enclosure facing down like this. So this is the front of the enclosure, and this is the back. So in the very back, we have the power coming in. We have the two heaters right here. Then these are the four outputs for the small fans to circulate air on the two heaters. If I end up uh, trying that out, I'm not sure yet. This is the connector for the current sensor. And this is of course the sensor, uh, the connector for the touch screen. And of course, as you can see, it's way bigger than it needed to be. Uh, it's not a dense layout at all, other than I guess somewhat down here. But it needed to be this big for two reasons. One is where the uh, mounting struts on the enclosure are, have to line up with these mounting holes. And then two, since this board is also acting as a light with the LEDs sprinkled throughout, it couldn't be like half the size here or it wouldn't spread out the light too much. Uh, and it made it easier to route, so I'm not complaining. And then this hole is where the filament will pass through into the actual enclosure to the uh, extruder head. So now here is the layout itself. This is with the uh, copper pores on. And so I guess what I'll do is just kind of start with kind of the priorities when I routed this board. Um, so since this is a high power board, each one of these heater outputs are like six ish amps. So we have 12 amps right here. That absolutely takes precedence when I'm routing this. So when I start a route, it's kind of a combination of putting the different components in blocks and routing them together. And it's on what do you start with first? Because of course, especially on a two layer board, there's always gonna be compromises with how you lay it out, but you wanna make sure that the compromises lean towards the less important components and not making a compromise on the most important. So for this board, 100% the most important is getting a good pathway for these heaters. 
So this is a one layer board and using a trace width calculator to have like a, I think it was a 10 or 15 Celsius uh, temperature rise, we needed the traces to be, I think it was like 150-ish mils on the single heater and then obviously around double that on the uh, trace that's gonna carry both. So a technique that I've done for quite a while, it's really helpful on single layer boards, on a, a one ounce copper boards that are a little bit thinner than like a two ounce copper, which is the standard high power board, is you basically make an identical trace, or in this case, a copper pour on the top as you do the bottom then you tie both layers together with a bunch of stitching vias. So it essentially doubles the amount of current you can carry at a given width. It makes this pour right here the exact same amount of copper as if I had a two ounce copper board with the trays just on the top. So that's what I did for the first center trace and then where it branches out it's just a single copper, uh, just a single layer, and same with on the right hand side. And I'll show you why that's important in a second. And then where the actual output goes, I tied them both back together. Uh, probably didn't need to, but sometimes these connectors can get kind of hot and I figured that that might help with some of the heat dissipation. So now, a really big thing that a lot of people, and I know when I was starting, uh, it's really easy to overlook or not understand, is you really have to pay attention to where the current returns. So in this board, it's super easy to see where the power goes out to the heater. So it comes in from our 24 volt connector, goes through here across our fuse, through here across our other fuse, and then out to the heater. And that's where a lot of people stop. But you also have to keep in mind where it goes back. So after it goes to the heater, it goes back into this connector, goes to the uh, source, the drain of the MOSFET, and then to the source of the MOSFET. Then once it's on our ground plane, it has to make it back to ground somehow. If you don't uh, factor that in, you're going to end up making this ground go some convoluted way around, potentially to a really small trace, and it's going to burn up that trace, in this case with a high power board. So that is why I kept this just on the top layer. So if we look at the left heater, it goes out, goes to the heater, then comes back to the ground on this MOSFET. Now there's a ton of vias all around it. This allows the return current to be on the top or the bottom layer. If it's on the bottom layer, pretty much has a direct shot. But since current will follow the path of least resistance on a low frequency signal like this, some of it will also inevitably stay on the top layer. When it's on the top layer, I add a bunch of stitching vias around any of the traces. So if there's any current that's here, it can easily drop down to the bottom layer and then hop back up if it wants to and go back to the ground terminal. And that's a good rule of thumb whenever you have a big trace that is bisecting a copper pour is to do extra vias around it to give any return signals the ability to jump under this trace. And now if you look at the other heater, it's a little bit worse of a layout just because there's a lot, of, lot more components here so it goes out to the heater, heats up, then comes back in, goes back to ground, and now right here it pretty much has to go to ground. Uh, wrong key. It has to go to the bottom layer because there's not a ton of space here. And once it's on the bottom, it can loop back around, which isn't ideal because that is a little bit of a loop, but I don't want to sacrifice this double layer here so it should be fine in sense I do have the stitching vias here that gives the current a lot of room to go to the top layer if it needs to. So essentially both of these layers are doubled up as well. So that, that doesn't concern me. So 
again, that was the biggest priority for the board. So that is what I worked on first. And another good tip with these high power boards is you kind of can treat it like an AC supply to where if it's an AC and a DC board, you separate the AC side out. And that's typically what I do here is all of the high power stuff stays the closest you possibly can to the connector. Just because there's no point in having the heaters on the opposite side of the board where you have to have all that current going all the way around the board. If you do it like this, it makes all the high power loops nice and close to the input. So now once that was done, really the only other high priority uh, component on this board is the switching supply. And even that's not super high priority because it's only really powering the screen and a couple other things. We're talking like two or 300 milliamps. So it's not gonna be that big of a concern. And it's not, this is just a personal use board. It's not gonna be subject to EMC testing. So it's not a huge concern, but you always wanna make sure you take care with your switching supplies. So basically what I did is just tied in the 24 volt supply from here and went straight under these components and then tapped it off here. And this isn't ideal. You don't really wanna take a bottom layer like this and go under all these components. But in this case, I really didn't have a choice other than branching over here which then that cut up this plane. So again, you have to make compromises and I would much rather compromise these couple components than my main power fed. So once it's here, it just goes straight up to where I have the switching supply. And I'm not gonna go super in depth on these regulators. One, because I'm certainly not an expert in their function and two, it's just way too much information for this video, but Basically what you wanna do is you wanna limit the loop area of a few different places. So first and foremost, you wanna limit the amount of space and the amount of traces from the input capacitors back to the ground of the, the ground of the regulator. So it goes in from 24 volts and then can loop right back in here. So that's about as short of a loop as you can possibly get. The second loop, if you have a catch diode and a bootstrap capacitor, you want to limit this loop area like that. And that's, again, about as short as it can be. And looking at this now, um, this is only a 14 mil trace. I would have liked to have seen this a decent bit wider. Um, not a ton because it is a switching node. Uh, but maybe like 20 mils uh, just to lower the resistance a bit, but it should be fine. Then the other loop that you want to uh, minimize the size is from your output to your catch diode all the way around here to your main inductor and then your output node, but from your output node also your capacitors. So basically on the main switching node, it goes out of the regulator through the, uh, uh, what's that called, a, a diode, through the diode and then back to the inductor and then out on the output of the inductor, it goes to your output caps and then you have to give that ground again, a way to return back to the chip. So it seems like a pretty big loop, but that's just because this inductor is pretty large um, and there's not a, not a whole lot we could have done to shrink it. Again, this isn't an ideal layout. I'm sure there's a lot of ways we could have improved it, but it should be fine for this. It's a pretty tolerant chip. Um, and then the other big thing, and this is in the data sheet too, is you'll always wanna keep as much of the ground currents around the chip on a single layer. Because if you make it dive into vias all the time, it's gonna introduce noise, especially again, since it's a switching regulator and it's going to have a lot of noise irradiating from it as it is, or noise radiating from it as well. So the ground, this loop can all stay on the top layer. The ground from our catch diode can stay on the top layer and our output caps do have to go under the uh, feedback trace and another five volt trace 
to the bottom layer back here. So an improvement I can see is probably I should have taken this five volt node and had this go on the bottom layer to keep these output caps on the top. Um, so again, there's always stuff you can do to improve it, but I it should be fine, we'll find out. So that was the second biggest priority. And honestly, after that is done and this was done, there's really not a lot to this layout. Uh, the next big, big-ish priority was just figuring out where the diodes would go, just because they're like an amp, I think, or 600 milliamps. So with them, I used a 20 some, uh, 25 mil trace all around here. And again, since it is somewhat high power, I have all of its drive down here by the input. So the main 24 volt supply for it is right here. So it comes from our main supply. It's as short of a path as we could do. And then the diodes go all the way around the board and then they end right back here where they go to our FET, which can grab ground right from here. And then there's our FET driver. And after that, really, it's just kind of putting stuff where it's convenient. Uh, there really isn't a priority after that. Because if we look at the schematic, really, we have the high power ish LEDs, we have the high power heaters, we have the switching uh, regulator, the FET driver for the heaters and the LEDs, those you want to keep as close as you can to the FET. But other than that, we have a temperature sensor, we have two uh, level changers for uh, PWM in the exhaust and the regular fans and a linear regulator and then just some connectors so once we get done at that point it's really just putting them where they fit uh, of course you want to keep everything as neat as possible so in the sake of time i'm really not going to go into anything else um, because the crucial parts are already done at that point so that pretty much wraps up this video. Um, the next video of this board will definitely be when I have the finished assembled board and hopefully testing it and it works. If not, I will probably make a video on troubleshooting it and getting the design changed. So thank you as always for watching and I will see you in the next video.